Welcome back everybody to me doing something stupid or something like that. So this is a test and um, maybe it'll work or it won't. What I thought, why not actually use the fact that I have like a GoPro to film my videos to actually, you know, walk around while talking to you. <laughs> so you don't have to see my ugly face and uh, see beautiful nature instead, which, you know, has its uh, advantages as well. I also want to just like, you know, find out if I can actually ramble while walking and, you know, don't do something stupid or concentrate on one or the other. So bear with me while I walk around and I figured we talk today about um, Equal Rights by Terry Pratchett, book three in the great Discworld read-along, which is what I actually wanted to talk about to you today. Um, we had our discussion about it last week. It went great and uh, we decided to actually speed up the read-along a bit. So we're going to talk about Mort by um, Terry Pratchett, book four, and one of those that a lot of people think is a great entry point um, because it's the first book about death, one of um, a lot of people's favorite characters in this world. Um, and we're going to talk about that one exactly one week, Sunday, the 22nd of August of August? Yeah, August. Uh, and, um, yeah, we're going to talk about it then. So if you feel like joining us, it's a good starting point for Discworld. It definitely is. So maybe join us on Iskard's Discord, The Unabridged Burners. Uh, link it below. We have a channel there to talk Discworld. You can talk, you know, Malazan and other stuff there as well. So why not do that and then join us for a discussion next Sunday. Um, so yeah, you know, I'm just like wandering around the fields for a while. <laughs> um, but before we do that, let's get started. I got myself a beer and uh, cheers. Now this is weird. I can't cheers into the camera with this one. Anyway, <laughs> let's have us a look on like the fields outside from where I live before it starts raining. So yeah, if you look down there, that's the city of Marburg um, with a castle and everything, but it's probably too foggy to see any, <laughs> to see a lot. Anyway, so Equal Rights is the third book and it's still one of the weird ones, I would say. It's also the first one that introduces the witches, which is one of the main aspects of Discworld, the idea of witchcraft versus wizardry. And um, it does that in a very typical Pratchett way by having a girl become a wizard. But the main thing there is it's the first one that actually has a full-on plot and it's one novel not like episodes like we've seen with the first two books. So there's that. And um, we see the Pratchett can actually deliver a good narrative that is a, an ongoing, you know, plot. It also, you know, introduces some new characters that we haven't seen before and that will become mainstays. One of them is um, Granny Weatherwax, the witch. So we'll see how she develops over time. Um, the plot itself is rather simple, but it also shows one of the main concerns of Terry Pratchett from early on, and that being something like gender equality gender roles, that kind of thing. Now, um, <clears throat> the the background obviously is that wizards are men and he starts with that whole like eighth son of an eighth son of an eighth son being a sorcerer or having magical power. <laughs> At least an eighth son of an eighth son already has power. So he does that and unfortunately it's an eighth daughter of an eighth son so <laughs> she inherits that power and she inherits a staff and then she has to go to wizard school <laughs> which Anseen University looks way more like Hogwarts and other stuff in this book than it does later on when we have like it more looking like a university but this is like still unformed um, metamorphing um, disc world where more or less everything is possible. We meet people that we never meet again or like meet 30 books later. One of those being, and this is one that is interesting to talk about, the Zunes, because we can tell that this book is it's from 87, I think, is still one of those books um, where language has, you know, not, has, is kind of different or things that we can say or like we're not, 
you know, thought as problematic to say, so put it that way, <laughs> um, uh, you know, showed up there, and that being gypsies. Now, there's a lot of discussion about this nowadays, but in the 80s, um, no one thought of it as problematic, which just shows you how much, how far we have come as a society since then, how much more we are aware of all kinds of problems in our history since then. But Cherry Pratchett goes in and actually shows up some of those like cliches, they're wandering, they're supposed to lie and take children, which they obviously all don't do in this book, which, you know, Terry Pratchett is not an idiot or a racist. But I guess nowadays people would definitely handle that kind of topic in a different way. So it felt something like a time travel, which, you know, once again, I find interesting. And it's one of the reasons why I always say, or why I prefer reading this world in publication order is exactly that. You get to see how times change on the Discworld, but also in our time and in our world, and how Pratchett as an author changes, and the world around him, the themes that are topics that are important change over time. So yeah. The Zunes, or the Gypsies, are one of the big things there. Another thing that is interesting is gender roles. <clears throat> Obviously the wizards, who always explain that uh, women can't be wizards for non-existing reasons, are the main villains here, or like the people that need a lot of changing of ideas. But when you look at it, Granny Weatherwax has also very rigid ideas of uh, gender roles. And um, when she discusses those with, um, what's his name, Drumbillet, the wizard, who has become a tree. And she has borrowed an owl and she's talking to him about all these things and gender roles. You can see that change when it comes to something like gender roles has to come from both sides. It's obviously men who have to, you know, be more open-minded and... Uh, bear the brunt of that and bear the larger responsibility here and i totally agree with that but it's also at the same time clear that there are at least in conservative circles and witches are nothing if not conservative um there are also uh, women who uh, need to rethink gender roles in a lot of ways <laughs> and um, that's something that we learn here as well so that's something that i really appreciate in this book um, and uh, yeah, let's look at some of the other things that are interesting here. One of them is obviously um, that um, the disc world has still not actually cohered into what we know later on. There's more elements that show up. The witches, the ram tops are finally named ram top mountains. You remember in like the first book, they're still called the Ramororg mountains for some reason, but I guess they're still the same mountains. Um, so yeah. This is um, one of those places where you see the world is still cohering. Another thing is that events that happen in this novel never show up again or don't show up until like the late part of the series. So the book obviously ends with Escarina Smith becoming the first female wizard and studying at Unseen University. And yeah, she remains the only one for a long, long time, to put it mildly. So it's definitely not a book that advanced overall um, Discworld, um, the overall Discworld timeline in a lot of ways, or the canon in a lot of ways. It kind of got, I don't want to say retconned, but, uh, because I think mostly Terry Pratchett just forgot that he wrote that book, or forgot some of the elements later on, which, you know, can happen if you write like over 30, like almost 40 books. So, you know, I get that. Um, uh, another bit is um, an element that we see more here and that we saw already near the end of La La Light Fantastic and that we will see again when it comes to magic. <clears throat> the idea of the dungeon dimensions and the creatures in the dungeon dimensions. We see those again when they try to take over the world. And once again, this I feel is a, an important bit of Discworld in general. I'll just walk back again because I, you know, don't want to know, you know, don't want to get lost today, I guess. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, so the idea that it is our imagination that makes us as humans unique in our world and that creates up to a certain point existence or reality and that there are people who that there are things out there that crave that imagination that fantasy that that thing that makes us so unique and alive and those people or I, don't, I shouldn't call them people those creatures try to catch it because that's like the thing like the the creatures from the dungeon dimensions they will destroy reality we know that but it's kind of sad because they just want to be part of it or want to be in it or want to be near it. So it's once again a call or I don't want to say call, but it's once again a um, way to look at the uniqueness of human imagination and what that means for the world and reality. And as I said, this is a theme that we find a lot of in the early Terry Pratchett before he moves on to other things so I guess in a way equal rights kind of ends or not ends but um, yeah, you know, yeah maybe ends that first part of um, the evolution of Discworld in that it once again focuses on the supremacy or the primacy of imagination and fantasy um, it also is the first one with a full-on um, plot, developed plot, and uh, yeah, how to say, um, yes, as I said, it's a full-on developed plot, and um, we are looking at more so societal issues as like gender roles in this one. We'll see what will come up in the next one that is Mort. So it kind of shows a first drift from sheer, you know, parody of fantasy literature uh, towards um, taking on real-world issues in a fantasy guise. So maybe it's because Terry Pratchett has gained more confidence in his creation of the Discworld or just like his ideas or like his interests have shifted at that point. I don't know, but it certainly, I would say, marks that end of a first era of Discworld, which I personally appreciate a lot, but I realize it's one that may be harder to get into nowadays because it is so far removed from uh, modern fantasy literature in a lot of ways. What else would be interesting about this book, let me think? Um, well, there are certainly even more like really good one-liners so the humor game has also kind of shifted i mean we still have um a lot like the typical thing that terry pratchett does that i think is kind of influenced by douglas adams at that point that being using comparisons to explain things that very much break any kind of um, immersion into disc world that you might have by referencing real world elements there's like this time around the one thing where he's like <laughs> with an effect that would make uh, steven spielberg's copyright lawyer <laughs> prick up his ears or something like that so it's like he explains things in ways that are very much not typical fantasy explanations for um, images and whatnot so there's that um, but he certainly has improved his one-liner um, quotation game a lot, especially with um, someone like Granny Weatherwax, who is a true master, mistress, master, I don't know, of <laughs> one-liners and terrible arguments. Another thing, though, that we see here with witches, and we're going to go back to the witchcraft stuff when we talk about book six, Weird Sisters. Um, is the way how witchcraft or headology, which is a great word, um, plays a lot on like the minds and expectations of people, which I guess, um, you know, is true. But it also shows a different part here that um, being English folklore that we haven't seen much of in the first two books. We haven't seen a lot of here yet either, but it comes more and more when we talk about the witches books in the Ramtop Mountains. It deals with that really odd thing that is English folklore, which is, for whatever reason, very different from any other kind of folklore. I mean, generally, like, folk tales, folk rites and whatnot are unique in wherever you go. It just seems in a lot of ways that um, the English folk traditions have, you know, 
through stuff like folk horror, like The Wicker Man and what have you, have ha made their way into pop culture in a way that most other folk traditions in the world have not. And Pratchett, you know, takes those and manages to poke fun at them and also, you know, preserve them in a way or honor them in a way. So that's something that we'll see more of in the future. So um, as we are close, you know, slowly getting closer to where I actually live, <laughs> I'm going to end this in a couple of seconds. And I hope it actually worked. Um, I'm not sure if I can do this all the time um, because... It kind of takes away mind power to actually walk, which just shows you how stupid I am, I guess. <laughs> but let me know if you enjoyed this and um, comment, like, subscribe and whatnot. And I'll talk to you tomorrow about um, Dancer's Lament, because we're actually going back into Malazan and I can't wait for that. So yeah, have a great Sunday and I'll talk to you tomorrow. Cheers.